Our news is brought to you by Alive. Believe in best. Coming up tonight on Our News. Malia Nassau Beach set to close for two years. The tourism minister weighs in. Why an activist is supporting government's temporary ban on travel from Haiti. And a little later, it's been a rough year for the judiciary. The chief justice delivers his annual report. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Christina Dragovich. Topping news tonight, the Malia Nassau Beach Resort is closing its doors for two years on March 1st as a multi-million dollar renovation commences. Tourism Minister Dionisio Diaguilar calling the news gut-wrenching, especially for the resort's approximately 300 employees. Here's Kyle Joaquin. With the construction of Bahamar's water park taking place right next door, there is a $100 million renovation set to take place at the Malia Nassau Beach Resort. However, it's the two-year closure that has left many employees heartbroken. Right now, um, it, it's very unfortunate news, and I, obviously I feel for, uh, for those employees. In a letter to employees, Malia General Manager Daniel Lozano said as the global travel industry continues to evolve, a decision was made to cease operations at the hotel for 24 months beginning March 1st. Lozano said the toughest part of our decision relates to those whom this decision impacts, which is you, our Melia family. Melia's GM continued expressing gratitude to employees who have been patient over the past 12 months, speaking to the possibility of employees being re-engaged. He said upon the resort's reopening, current Melia associates will be invited to apply and will be given every consideration and opportunity for employment. Their intention was to do it piece piece. Um, obviously, if there were guests in the hotel, the best way to do it is to have one half of the hotel generating revenue while the other half is under renovation and then to switch over and do that. And they just felt it was more cost effective given the fact that we are in this period of low occupancy to, um, to, to shutter that hotel and to undergo a, uh, a, a, a redevelopment of that hotel. Maley and Bahamar share the same owners. Bahamar President Graham Davis also releasing a statement explaining the $100 million renovation will create more job opportunities for Bahamas. He said as construction commences, the renovation will also create approximately 150 new employment opportunities for Bahamas through the renovation. Upon the resort's opening in 2023, significant new employment opportunities will be created at the new resort. The renovation includes upgrades to Malia's 694 guest rooms, restaurants and outdoor areas, among others, with reopening set for 2023. Diagler says with countries like Canada still under lockdown, there is a long road ahead for the Bahamas' tourism product. He says key to that rebound is ensuring Bahamans, especially those working in tourism, get vaccinated. We know that we have to do our healthcare workers and our, our uniform branches, but you know the next group after that hopefully will be our tourism workers to get the economy going, to get people back to work. For Our News, I'm Kyle Joaquin. Well, a human rights activist is supporting government's 21-day travel ban on Haiti, but he says he believes it could have been handled differently. Luby George today telling our news that while many may see the ban as a drastic measure impacting scores of Haitians, he understands why government made the move. Today is the first day of a 21-day travel ban against air and sea travel from Haiti, according to an amendment to government's emergency powers released Saturday. Foreign Affairs Minister Darren Henfield has confirmed that the ban is a preventative measure as Haiti recently commenced its carnival season. George says the National Carnival in Haiti is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, event in Haiti, and this year is no different. I particularly watched the opening ceremony of the carnival and you know, I, it was scary. It was very scary. You know, thousands of people crammed together, thousands, literally thousands of people crammed together. And I think it was, you know, uh, it, 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 some may say it, it's, you know, irresponsible on behalf of the, the president. Um, to host such an event. Other countries in the region have cancelled their annual carnivals as a result of the pandemic, with the Bahamas cancelling Junkanoo to prevent the spread of the virus. While George says he understands the move, he immediately heard from scores of Bahamians who say their plans have been disrupted, including some who are currently in Haiti, but whose work permits expire over the next 21 days. They're wondering now, how will this affect me? You know, I'm, I'm a legal resident of the Bahamas, but my my legal document that allows me to go first through Haiti's airport because the Haitian authorities in Haiti, they also check your legal status to come to the Bahamas. So when they check that and they see that, hey, 
this person's permit is expired, then, you know, so there's great concern uh, in the community. Uh. George also questioning why now, considering Haitian travelers, like those from other countries, have been receiving RT-PCR tests required for travel visas before entering the country. So then why take this drastic position? Because you're already required to take a test that is no more than five days old before jumping on a plane and coming to the Bahamas anyway. According to the World Health Organization, Haiti has recorded 12,143 confirmed cases of COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic and 247 deaths. While a court ruled that a man defended himself when he pushed a police officer who was trying to search him illegally, Jared Higgs tells their story. 44-year-old Sean Mortimer and 39-year-old Andrew Heiler are both overcome with relief after a magistrate acquitted them of charges stemming from an incident where police tried to search the men, it turns out unlawfully. Those four police officers were acting like, like, like gangsters. It was March 5, 2019 when Mortimer, a married father of two and the owner of Mortimer's Motorcycles and Small Engine Repairs on Sapodilla Boulevard, was getting ready to service a scooter for Heiler, a friend, customer and business associate. However, police in plain clothes arrived and demanded a search of Heiler. Heiler says he complied with the officers, but they were handling him aggressively. So he called out for Mortimer to witness what was happening. While I'm cuffed now, be trying to kick me off my foot. If I cuff and I fall down, that means I could bust my face up, right? Another officer then started searching Mortimer, who was also handcuffed. Both men protested the police's actions, resulting in them being arrested. They were charged with resisting arrest and disorderly behavior, while Mortimer alone was charged with assaulting a police officer. They pleaded not guilty, insisting that they did nothing wrong. The incident was captured by neighboring security cameras. At one point, an officer is seen walking up to a neighbor, recording the incident on his cell phone and taking the phone from the man. This devastated me, to be honest with you, because I'm a law-abiding citizen. I abide by the, the laws of the country. I have no problem with the police force, but I'm, a, I'm the breadwinner of my family. So you're going to take my freedom based on three false charges? After nearly two years, Magistrate Ambrose on Bristol ruled that Inspector Jamal Adderley and Corporal 3680 Carroll, two of the officers involved in the incident, lacked reasonable suspicion that Mortimer and Hyler had committed or were about to commit any crimes. Therefore, the searches were unlawful. Um, Brister also found that a search warrant presented to the court that both Hyler and Mortimer say was never presented to them on the day in question was outdated by nearly eight months. And Bristol's ruling found that the officers' actions were unlawful, and if Mortimer did in fact push one of the officers, he was within his right to do so. Mortimer and Hyler admit that they wouldn't have had the success that they did if it weren't for their attorneys. Those men say they had to really dig deep in this case. Rizard Humes and Crispin Hall say they didn't even have to present their defenses with the magistrate accepting their no-case submissions. There's a prevailing view in the public that um, such charges that Mr. Mortimer and Mr. Hyler face are somewhat indefensible. And I think this case was important uh, to show that that is not the case, that there's not um, an absolute power that the police have to search. It's a victory for everyone who believes that you go to court, you'll have your day in court, you're entitled to a fair hearing, and you're innocent until proven guilty. Mortimer and Hyler think they were profiled by the officers as guys just hanging out in Pinewood. Hyler says the incident has left him wary of police and nervous for his son who's turning 18 soon. Right now, he don't look, he look at the police as help as somebody he could run to. Not somebody he should run from. Are all police bad? No, no sir, no sir. There's a handful of bad apples in the police force, just like there's a handful of bad apples in the Pinewood Gardens community. That don't make everyone bad. Reporting for our news, I'm Jared Higgs. Well, it was a beautiful day in the Capitol today. Here's Greg Thompson in the weather studio with a look ahead. Thanks, Christina. In our first look at weather, brought to you tonight by Ports International for all your medical supplies and the equipment needs. Warm day around the islands. Once again, temperatures managed to get up into the 80s. Unseasonably warm. We're settling into the mid-70s with 75 degrees outside our studios under partly cloudy skies. It's a bit on the breezy side. Winds out of the south at 10 knots, your feels like temperature around 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Around the island, satellite view, beautiful conditions that a high pressure system remains in charge, generating that southeast to southerly flow, bringing in some isolated showers across the southeast Bahamas, but all in all, a beautiful evening setting up on the outdoors. That's your first look at weather. Your extended forecast is still to come. Still to come on our news, an FNM MP defends his track record over the last four years. And a little later, more than 500 couples filed for divorce last year. Our Jasmine Brown takes a look. Stay with us.
every new season of On the Record, we push the limits. Venture into unknown territory. We take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the Record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV Cable Channel 212 and streaming live on Facebook on the R News Bahamas page. The Judiciary of the Bahamas releasing its 2020 annual report and, as expected, it reveals the courts had a rough year due to the global COVID-19 pandemic. There was a reduction in cases being filed, heard and disposed of in the Supreme Court, while the Magistrates Court faced unprecedented challenges. Jasmine Brown reports. The 112-page document giving a detailed overview of how courts across the country functioned during the global pandemic. When the first case of COVID-19 was discovered in March 2020, Chief Justice Sir Brian Marie QC told the press that the pandemic would not bode well for the already clogged court system. The CJ implemented the court coronavirus mitigation protocols just days after the Bahamas recorded its first case to ensure the courts were not shut down by the pandemic. Despite their best efforts, the CJ admits the pandemic took its toll. The pandemic has affected our ability to conduct um, all of our court hearings. The report notes, notwithstanding the myriad of challenges as a direct result of the coronavirus pandemic, it will be seen from a review of our statistics that while there has been a reduction in numbers generally, overall these results reflect, when compared to last year's numbers, that the courts have continued to almost fully operate. As it relates to the Supreme Court, the Family Registry reported 579 new divorce applications in 2020, while the Criminal Registry reported a 73% reduction of Crown briefs. When it comes to the Civil Registry, there were 1,176 new applications filed compared to the 1,659 filed in 2019. That represents a 29% decrease. The report and the CJ note that part of the reason they were able to keep the Supreme Courts almost fully functioning was through the use of technology. We have been able to, to maintain our, our calendar to some extent, but there's no question that we have some backlog log of civil trials which have to be addressed. Meantime, the magistrate's court did not go unscathed by the pandemic. The report notes the lockdowns, curfews and public health requirements for physical distancing together with limited space available in the magistrate's court complex led to the suspension and or reduction of certain court hearings. It also points out that not once during the state of emergency did the courts shut down and reveal that last year the magistrate's courts on New Providence heard more than 24,000 matters and collected more than $5.3 million in fines. We have a big backlog in the magistrate's court and that's going to be um, a primary um, matter which I'm going to focus on in January and February um, because really technology is, is a little more difficult to integrate into the delivery of court services in the magistrate's court because we have so many litigants and individuals, individuals representing themselves and their access to technology is somewhat limited. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. North Abaco Member of Parliament Darren Henfield is defending his time as the area's MP saying he did his best. Here's Berthony McDermott. After being ratified as the Free National Movement's standard bearer for North Abaco, Darren Henfield defended his term as the area's MP, saying he did his best. The Foreign Affairs Minister, along with the entire Minister administration, came under fire following Hurricane Dorian, the monster storm that nearly decimated parts of Abaco. But according to Henfield, he did all he could. I did my best. I did my best given all of the circumstances that we faced. I did my best and I think most people will understand I did my best. I mean. I rode out the storm with my people. The storm was, was very devastating to all of us. Uh, stayed there long after, and I remain with my people in North Abaco. We, we will not stop until we recover all that Dorian has tried to steal from us. That's where we are. In the months following the devastation left behind by Dorian, many Abaco residents said they felt abandoned by the government, which they claimed wasn't acting quick enough in the rebuilding process. But the North Abaco MP is saying otherwise. Dorian was the, was the first of its kind. Uh, for any government in this region, anywhere in the world, governments will have been challenged with the way you responded to Dorian. There's no textbook response that one could come up with for Dorian. You know, and, and I think in the circumstances we did our best, 
Well, we're very pleased and grateful to God that we had a lot of help in the aftermath. Uh, people are still with us trying to help us recover and rebuild. Henfield was one of 18 candidates ratified by the FNM in recent weeks. Last week, Central and South Abaco MP James Albury said he will not be seeking re-election. When asked if he is confident that he will again snatch the North Abaco seat, here is what Henfield had to say. That is left in the hands of the people of North Abaco, uh, who they will make their MP. But I'm going to continue to work as hard as I can uh, to earn their trust. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. When our news comes back from the break, building homes to weather the storm on Sweeting's Key, plus Marcellus Hall has the inside track on the sports scene. Stay with us. Every new season of On the Record, we push the limits. Venture into unknown territory. We take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV Cable Channel 212 and streaming live on Facebook on the R News Bahamas page. This is R News. Welcome back. With stronger storms making landfall in the Bahamas in recent years, there's been a call for changes to the building code to ensure homes are made storm resilient. For the team rebuilding homes on Sweetings Key that were obliterated by monster storm Dorian more than 14 months ago, it's more than just a suggestion, it's a mandate. Officer in charge and assistant structural engineer at the Ministry of Works in Grand Bahama, Tony Hudson Bannister. Uh mandate is to make sure that our residents are safe and so from a structural standpoint we're looking at the concrete grade the materials being used the fasteners the connections and basically the envelope of the structure to make sure that the homeowner will be safe and so from what we're seeing here today we see that the structure is elevated and also taken in consideration that some of these persons are elderly and so it'll also be where they're able to still access the building once a ramp I hear is a part of a second phase that's going to be going into these homes. In the weeks following Hurricane Dorian, officials announced that the Ministry of Public Works was working to revise the country's building code. Consideration is being given to creating no-build zones in areas that experience 20-foot storm surges. Area MP Peter Turnquest says it's important to rebuild, but also to do it resiliently. This is uh, not just about uh, building a home, but this is about creating communities uh, and, and creating opportunities and reasons for people to come back and to stay here and to continue to sustain these communities. In sports tonight, a new national record for Shawnee miller Weibo and the return of youth baseball. Here's Marcellus Hall. Thanks as usual and welcome to our sports on a Monday, everybody. I'm Marcella Hall. It was a busy weekend for our Bahamian athletes uh, and everything from track and field to baseball to basketball. Let's start with the highlight of the weekend, which was be Shawnee Milawebo taking the track once again. Bahamian track star Shawnee Milawebo on the track Saturday. Milawebo competing at the New Balance Indoor Grand Prix in New York. Reigning Olympic champion in the 400 meters, Shawnee showing her championship form. She dominated the field, cruising to a new national and NACAC area record time of 50.21 seconds. American Wadalene Jonanis finished a distant second in a time of 51.95 seconds. Meanwhile, youth baseball making its return as Freedom Farm Baseball League hosting its All-Star Weekend at the Freedom Farm Baseball Field. Utilizing strict social distancing protocols, the league was able to pull off a well-organized event that was well received. Divisions contested included the 13 and 14 age group and the 15 to 18 age groups. Buddy Heel and the Kings playing last night versus the Memphis Grizzlies. Heel would play 31 minutes, making just two of his 10 shots. They finished, he finished with eight points and six rebounds. Kings take the loss, not surprisingly, 124 to 110. They play again tonight versus the Brooklyn Nets. DeAndre Ayton and the Suns also seeing action. They took on the Orlando Magic yesterday. Suns on a roll. They win their sixth straight game. 109 to 90 ends up being your final. DeAndre posting a double-double in this one. 10 points and 13 rebounds. Suns will play again. They play the Nets on Tuesday. And that is your look at sports here on this Monday. I'm Marcellus Hall. Back to you. Thanks, Marcellus. Greg has the weather outlook for the week and how one organization is fighting hunger and making a difference. Stay with us. 
Every new season of On the Record, we push the limits. Venture into unknown territory. We take our cameras into places unseen before. We share the stories and experiences that affect us all. And now it's time for season five. On the Record, Thursdays at 8 p.m. on RTV Cable Channel 212 and streaming live on Facebook on the R News Bahamas page. Welcome back to our news. Perfectly warm weather over the next few days. Greg is back in the Weather Center with the Outlook. Thanks again, Christina. In our second look of weather, we take a look at our satellite view around the area. Unseasonably warm temperatures are with us as a high pressure system continues to bring in that southeast southerly flow. That high is jutting across us from the Atlantic and that will continue for the next couple of days. Weather change is expected by the weekend. Friday, we do expect low pressure system to develop in the Gulf of Mexico. That will in turn drag another frontal boundary across the northern Bahamas. So we're looking at some cooler temperatures, but the windy conditions will continue for the balance of the week. Your boating forecast for the northwest and central Bahamas tonight through tomorrow. We have a caution flag posted for you guys. Your winds will be southeast to south, 15 to 20 knots. Seas running 4 to 6 feet over the ocean. While in the southeast Bahamas, we have an advisory posted for you guys down there. Stronger winds, east to southeast, 15 to 25 knots. Seas running 5 to 8 feet over the ocean. Here's a look now at your national forecast. A look now at your extended forecast through Saturday. That's a look at our weather. Make it a great night, everyone. Christina. Thanks, Greg. From time to time, you may have seen their trucks on the street delivering surplus food to different organizations or delivering food packages to families impacted by the pandemic. Tonight, our Georgie O'Bain takes a look at Hands for Hunger in this week's Make a Difference. Hands for Hunger has saved millions of pounds of surplus food since it was founded to fight hunger in the Bahamas. Executive Director Keisha Ellis says operations expanded under the weight of double disasters, Hurricane Dorian and the COVID-19 pandemic. But Ellis, who has been a part of the Hands for Hunger team for six years, says she is proud of what the small organization has accomplished. We have rescued and delivered over two million pounds of food right, since we started. And we like to say that a pound of food equals one meal. Um, so we know that we've at least provided um, two million meals to people. We know it's actually a lot more than that in terms of the vouchers and just all of the other programs that we do. The small team at Hands for Hunger has expanded operations to a full seven day work week. But Ellis says the work has been worth it. The team sees it every day, you know, we're talking to people every day that are asking for food assistance. We get the calls from people who are saying thank you. You know, the box that you delivered to my house made a real difference in the lives of my family and my children. And while the team appreciates the gratitude, they remain focused on helping organizations and families facing dire circumstances. It feels good, but it also shows me how much more work we have to do. Um, I mean, if you look at Hurricane Dorian and then COVID-19, we have people that, you know, had no reason to really expect that they would ever be in a position where they need to ask for help, you know? Um, so we're finding that there are a lot of people who just, they don't even know how to ask for food assistance. Volunteer relations are currently on hold, but there is still something you can do to help. A cash donation through our website, www.handsforhunger.org. Um, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that because we are a nonprofit organization, we get deals in our purchases. So if you donate a dollar to us, we can stretch that into two dollars more easily than you can. So we really appreciate cash donations as well as canned goods and other donations. So if you um, if you work someplace or just among your friends, you want to start a canned food drive. We love that. We encourage that. Reporting for our news, I'm Georgie O'Bain. Thank you for joining us for our news tonight. I'm Christina Dragovich. Stay tuned for the season premiere of The Charlie Bahama Show, featuring all of the stars from your favorite RTV originals in a one-hour special. We'll see you right back here tomorrow night. Have a beautiful evening, Bahamas.